Let's continue our look at some of the wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes. The Proverbs that are kind of being inserted at this point are focused particularly on how wisdom can impact your life. And that's important because all of us are going to eventually face death. And that end is to be considered carefully. So Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 1, he starts with a question. Who is like the wise? Who knows the interpretation of a thing? So it's an open question. It's, what are wise people like? Who are the wise people out there? Who can understand life? Then he says this, A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. We all understand that sometimes people get this hardness of their face, particularly when they're feeling down or angry or gloomy. But wisdom can change the way you approach even the toughest times in your life. And it can brighten up your face because you know you've got promises that have been made in Scripture that, for example, Romans 8, 28, God is able to work together all things together for good to those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So when we face all of the difficulties of life and we remind ourselves of that truth it can get us through the tough times, knowing that we can trust God. Verse 2, I say, keep the king's commandment because of God's oath to him. Now, this, of course, is being written down by a king. Now, I think it's King Hezekiah. And he understood that there were rules given to the Israelis that they were supposed to obey the king because... The king was supposed to be obeying God. In fact, the ceremony for becoming king in Israel seems to have involved standing between the two pillars of the front porch of the temple, the pillars that were called Yakin and Boaz, which form a sentence in Hebrew, he shall establish in strength. And there... On that porch, in the front of God's temple, the king took an oath to do God's work, to do things God's way. And so what this proverb is reminding the reader of is you need to do what the king says because the king is doing what God says. It's a similar principle to Romans 13, where... In the ideal, every ruler is supposed to be punishing evildoers and rewarding good doers because they're supposed to be representing God. So that's what's coming out here. And so that's why we as Christians are expected to be obedient to all the laws of the land unless that law specifically violates something God told us to do. For example, uh, we know that God tells us we should not be murdering anyone. So if for some crazy reason the government came to you and told you you had to murder someone on their behalf, we'd have to decline and take whatever consequences came from that. Now, I use that as the most blatant, obvious example of where we cannot obey the government. If they told us that we have to deny Jesus as Lord and Savior, we would, of course, have to say no and take whatever consequences come from that. But on the other hand, if the government tells us to do anything else, it might be even stupid sounding to us. If it doesn't violate something God has told us to do, we're supposed to do it. It's as simple as that, folks. So keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. 
Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in the evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. Now, this is, again, this idea of a relationship with uh, government is that you shouldn't be hasty to try to escape out of the presence of rules and things like that uh, because, well, rules are there for a reason. Uh, and definitely, we should not be standing up for wrong things uh, because uh, the king or government, as we have to keep uh, substituting for our own purposes, uh, is going to do what it needs to do. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? So this is a, a this is perspective of the government is the ultimate authority of the land. Well, God obviously is above government, but in the land, let's use our example here. In the United States, the federal government and the state governments represent the ultimate authority for us. And we have to do what they tell us to do. And uh, when they're carrying out their rules, none of us are able to say, hey, you can't do that. Who put you in charge? Because they are in charge. And we need to submit to that. And that's even the word that's used in the New Testament. Uh, verse number five, whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time in the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. Uh, general rule, general principle, people who obey the laws of the land have the least amount of troubles. Because rules are typically there for a reason. I know a whole bunch of you do not like speed limit rules, and I am sorry for the fact that you feel that way. But the truth of the matter is, speed laws are necessary to save lives. And we as Christians are duty-bound to follow the posted speed limit. Same thing with yield signs and stop signs and crossing, uh, walk, uh, uh, crossing walk signs. All of those are there for a reason and for the safety and security of the people as a whole. So be obedient to it. And the most people will benefit from that situation. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have nothing but trouble. You know, chaos is not a good situation to live under. Verse 7, For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? So we don't know the future. That's also mixed in here. Uh, no man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. That's a repeated principle that I keep coming back to in the book of, of uh, Ecclesiastes. Is life is outside of our control. We can't decide when our death date is. I mean, you could say, well, I can commit suicide. You can do that, but that would be foolish to throw away God's gift to you. But you cannot say, I am going to live until I'm 120 years old, exactly, and be sure that that's going to happen, because you're not in control. Um, there is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. Now, this discharge in war thing, that, that's of interest to me, having served in the military, and I know that there have been times where all separation papers became null and void because there was a, a war on the horizon. That people who thought they were about to be discharged suddenly found themselves forced to remain in service longer because their services were needed. And so that's the point here is all of our lives are out of our own control. There are other powers, other situations that feed into how our life goes. And if you get um, caught up in wickedness and sin and realize that you're in trouble, 
that is just going to follow its own course. You're not going to be able to stop that. Uh, you can't get into the middle of a sin and then the consequence start hitting and go, no, 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 I really didn't mean to get th to this point. It's too late then. Verse number nine. All this I observed while applying my heart to all the, that all that is done under the sun when a man had power over man to his hurt. So the interaction of people with one another uh, is one of the reasons why our life is not fully under our own control. Uh, I've mentioned this several times uh, in the teaching of Scripture, is that there is this complex interwoven web of cause and effect. And it's not just the things that we cause that affect us. It's the causes of other people that affect us. And our causes affect them. And it's not just in this moment of time. It, it goes backward and forward in time. I mean, think about the fact that what Adam and Eve chose to do that day in the Garden of Eden is still impacting on us to this very day. And we are many, 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 many generations separated from them. Uh, so when we look at reality, we know that it is out of our control. The only thing that we have control of is our own personal choices right this moment. Verse 10, then I saw the wicked buried. So he sees a bad guy. They used to go in and out of the holy place and they were praised in the city where they had done such things. Uh, this also is vanity. So he says, I saw a bad guy's funeral. And where he used to go in and out on his own steam, he's now being carried. And they're even taking him to a funeral service. And they're praising him for things when in fact he did a lot of bad. And we all know this is true too. Um, I have seen politicians who have been horribly um, critical of a political opponent. And then suddenly that opponent dies. And uh, now the remaining person starts talking about the good things that that person did. That's unfortunately one of the realities of living in this fallen world. Verse number 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Uh, we have a related saying in our modern language where we say justice delayed is justice denied. Um, we need swift resolution of bad behavior so that people who might be tempted to engage in that same sort of bad behavior will think twice before engaging in it. This is one of the purposes of capital punishment, is when someone engages in behavior that takes away other people's lives or maybe takes away their body by raping them or kidnapping them. If those people who committed those crimes are not executed, then other people may think they could get away with it, that it would be worth engaging in, the risk of maybe being caught and then uh, just spending a whole bunch of time um, in jail being fed and, and housed. Maybe it would be worth the momentary pleasure of doing those other things. So we really do need to have a fair and speedy criminal courts system. If somebody is not punished for their crime for years and years and years, there is really no purpose in the justice system. It's got to be fixed. Verse number 12. Though a sinner does an evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. 
Now, now this line is specifically targeted against us who um, might be frustrated by seeing that justice is, in fact, delayed. It doesn't matter that those people seem to be, quote, getting away with it, end quote. What they did was wrong, and none of us should be engaging that behavior. Uh, Just because I see people getting away with evil does not give me permission to engage in evil, because evil is wrong. So we need to fear God and do what he wants us to do, regardless of what everybody else is doing. Verse 13, but it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. Uh, So eventually, the justice of God will catch up with every sinner. And they will die physically. They might be old when it happens. Uh, But then they will face the eternal judgment of God for how they've lived that life. Uh, And it doesn't matter if they live a really long life. That's the idea, the prolonging his days like a shadow. Think about the whole Hezekiah story about the sign that he had for his uh, uh, proof he would be able to be healed of his fatal disease. He wanted the shadow clock to go backwards. Well, here... Uh, the idea of a long, long, long shadow is the tail end of a day. And so apparently these guys have lived about as long as they can. But it doesn't matter. They still are going to face God's judgment. Verse 14. There is a vanity that takes place on earth. So something that's out of control. That there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. And I said that this also is vanity, similar to something we already saw in this book. Sometimes good things happen to bad people. And sometimes bad things happen to good people. It's just part of living in this chaotic, out-of-control world where... Things sometimes are just random. Uh, We're going to come to that in a little bit. I commend joy, for man has no good thing under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. So even in the midst of seeing things kind of topsy-turvy, Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Even in the midst of that, his advice is, look, you need to just make the most of the day you got. Eat the things that God has provided and enjoy it. I mean, he gave you taste buds for, and for a reason and the, the sense of smell for a reason so that you can enjoy it. So eat and drink. Be joyful. Be happy. For that's, that's the good part of life. Yeah, it's got its bad parts. You, you've got to work hard and things like that. But God did give us the ability to enjoy life as it's lived. Make the most of that. Verse 16. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that's done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, Then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However, much man may toil in seeking. He will not find it out. Uh, Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. So in this life, sometimes you have sleepless nights, worrying about life, thinking about the future, thinking about what needs to be done the next day. It doesn't matter how much toil you put into trying to sort it all out. Uh, The writer of Ecclesiastes, King Hezekiah in my estimation, comes to the conclusion, look, you can't understand everything that's going on because only God understands that stuff. Even the wisest people on planet Earth 
cannot understand everything and the whys and wherefores of life. If they claim they can, they're wrong, they're lying. Only God knows. And so we, as believers in God, have got to just trust him that he will make all things work together for good to those who love him and who are the called according to his purpose. Chapter number nine. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man doesn't know. Both are before him. So he says, I'm looking over life. I'm looking over the record. But in the end, everything is only known by God. It's in his hands. We as people, we don't know how we're going to be treated throughout our lives. Uh, Whether or not we'll be loved or hated, only God knows. It is the same for all since the same event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice, As to the good, so to the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. So he's basically just throwing, you know, the opposites out here. Good people, bad people is is what it's boiled down to. All of them have the exact same final experience. Verse 3. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. So everybody dies, he says. Good, bad, and everybody in between. And yes, sometimes they are very wicked. Sometimes... They're very confused, you know, the madness here, trying to sort things out. But everyone dies. Verse 4, but he who is joined with all the living has hope. So as long as you're still alive, you can do stuff. That's his point. If you're still alive, you've still got hope in front of you. Then he gives this little proverb, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. So lions were thought of as being kind of the king of the beasts and regal and all of that. And dogs were nasty garbage eaters. But a dead lion is a dead animal. While a living dog is a living animal. So better off the dog than the lion. Verse 5, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Now I want to point out here. Uh, the writer of, Pro- of Proverbs, the writers of, of uh, the Proverbs, the writers of many of the scriptures believe clearly that the Spirit goes into a waiting place in the Old Testament time and is conscious and aware. Uh, Luke chapter 16 Uh, the story that Jesus tells about the rich man that goes to Hades is one of the testimonies to this reality. But in a passage like this, uh, the Ecclesiastes writer is focused on the body. He's focused on the physical form. And once that shell is emptied, it doesn't do anything. And that's his point. So, again, here's what he says. He says that the dead know nothing. So that body doesn't think. It just lays there. They have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. He mentions this before, that uh, uh, generations that come later won't even remember some of these dead people. Uh, Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they will no more share in all that is done under the sun. So his big point is, when your body is dead, your body is done. There's nothing for it to do now except be laid in the ground 
and decompose. But if you're alive, even if you're having a tough life, you're alive. And you can do stuff. So do it. And then we come to another one of his little mini conclusions. Verse 7. Go, eat your bread in joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Now, he's already said that you should be working if you're physically capable of doing so. Now he's saying, when you're not working, enjoy your life. Be happy. Let your garments be always white. Uh, that is the idea of having, uh, you know, happy attire. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Uh, each day that the Jewish people got up, they'd wash themselves, and then they would put sometimes scented olive oil in their hair, in their beard, if they were a gentleman, on their face, and uh, this would make them feel nice. And so he says, don't skimp on your oil habit. Make yourself feel good. Verse number nine, enjoy life with the wife whom you love. Uh, flip it, flip the gender if your gender is opposite. Enjoy life with the spouse whom you love all the days of your vain life, not worthless, just out of control. All the days of your out of control life that he has given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Uh, this is quoted in the New Testament or alluded to in the next New Testament a couple of times. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. So a reference to your body. One of these days, your body is going to be done doing stuff. Until then, let your body do good stuff. And enjoy itself with your friends, your family, your acquaintances. Uh, you need to make the most of life now while you have opportunity because it's a gift from God.